Hi guys, welcome to English 231, Early American Lit. Um, our entire class spans from the beginnings, um, sort of like our uh, creation stories, uh, and I don't mean like, the, you know, Adam and Eve or anything, but uh, indigenous people's creation stories that are relative to what we call America, um, and then all the way up until again, still talking about the entire span of our course, all the way up until 1865. So uh, unit one covers pretty much the majority of that, right? It, it's from the beginnings until 1820, and that's kind of what we're talking about here. Um, and that is what the pages in our textbook are talking about for unit one. Um, just a quick disclaimer, um, these slides and lecture video are not necessarily intended to replace the content in the reading. So the reading is long, it's from page 3 to um, I think 25 or 26, something like that. Um, I, I actually usually find these types of readings as very dense and dry and difficult to get through. It took me about two days to read it, not that I didn't stop and do other things, but um, it just, I couldn't sit and read it all at once. Um, that's just personally, I'm not able to read for very long, but um, I didn't find this as terrible as I thought I was going to. And I, I say that because um, I was terrible in history class when I was a student. And so anyway, it's long, um, but I guess what I mean is that Considering how much I don't like reading things like this, it actually went much more quickly than I thought it was going to. Um, and, you know, at, just as a reminder, you have the entire duration of Unit 1 to do this quiz um, and to work through the content in the introduction here, um, which includes the lecture, slides, and video as well. Um, don't wait until the last minute because at the end of the first unit, you also have a paper due. I would try to get this done within the first couple of weeks, but um, if you want to focus on the weekly content first and then just kind of pace yourself throughout the six weeks to get that quiz done, you can do that. Um, I think that's pretty much everything that I want to say about my little disclaimer here. Um, a, a few more points just just really quickly. I don't cover everything in this lecture video that I do in the text. You don't need to watch this lecture video to get a hundred on the quiz. Um, the quiz comes straight out of the book. There's nothing I'm going to say in here that's not in the book. Um, that's on the quiz, if that makes sense. Um, my only other thing that's not mentioned in writing here, but I want to say to you is simply that um, I I am not 100% sure how to pronounce some of the names that I will I will speak while uh, going through this lecture. So please forgive me. I'm I don't know exactly how to say some of the names, um, and I'm sure that I will I will. I will do some of them wrong, but I'm going to try it anyway, and I'm not going to um, skip them. So, all right, um, I'm organizing these slides in terms of the headings found within the chapter. So, I'm going to be kind of going through, I guess, what stuck out to me, some of the things that were most important. Um, and of course, again, I'm not covering everything, but I'm going through just heading by heading. And so the first heading that we get is kind of like questions of identity. And I think our book is talking about, you know, how do we find an identity in the midst of exploration, figuring out how to interact with people who don't speak the same language, don't have the same customs, don't have the same religion, don't look the same, don't dress the same, don't really do much of the same things. Um, how do you find a, an identity as a nation in, in that? Um, and how, how do you deal with the identity throughout the process of exploration, colonization? Um, what we look at, again, all the way through, we're going through 1820 here, uh, independence and then finding the identity after independence because when you first came to this land you were part of you know a different empire and all of that so um, we're processing through these questions of identity kind of in a nutshell here in the beginning of the chapter and so you know John Smith uses the Christian identity as fuel for colonization um, and the, the Christian identity identity of Europeans. And I don't think that we're at the point yet of saying we're looking for a place in order to 
get out of religious persecution. I think that comes later, but more so as um, it is our duty as Christians. Again, this is John Smith's feeling. Uh, it is our duty as Christians to um, explore the world and make sure that everyone knows um, who God is and that every we can you know get as many people to believe in God because that is our duty as Christians. And so um, that is kind of... The identity of a Christian fuels his belief in exploration and colonization, and, and that's the right thing to do. Um, now, we're jumping from John Smith to uh, J. Hector St. John de Crevecour. I'm not sure that that's correct. Um, and we're jumping like 150 years here. And he seems to present the first definition of, of what I think... Um, is kind of often been used as American identity, which is the melting pot concept. So here we are in 2020, um, and in 1782, we're starting to get that concept of um, this is a melting pot. Now you think about that time frame. This is uh, just after the Revolutionary War, um, and and so who's living in America at that time, right? Colonization has happened. Here we are. We've broken free from Great Britain, and, and what is America? And, you know, we've got um, the uh, African Americans who are enslaved. We've got the Native Indigenous people who were, were here when um, Columbus came to the land. And now we have, of course, all of the different identities who left England. So that's interesting uh, that the melting pot concept is, gets pushed so far back. Um, in 1805, we also have, you know, we don't ne only have um, the collective American voice asking, like, what is the identity of America, but we also have particular communities asking about what is the identity of my community. And in this case, we've got Native communities, uh, Red Jacket, whose Native name is, and again, probably butchering this, uh, Sagayawatha, I'm sure there's, it's much more beautiful if said in the native tongue. Um, but in 1805, you know, talking about how native communities identity is deeply rooted in the land and in religious tradition. And here, I think this is paired with what we're going to talk about kind of at the end of this lecture. And that's the fact that um, there is a religious revival at the same time that there is or there's like a spiritual revival in uh, indigenous communities in the same time that there is a um, an American, mm, that's not the right word, uh, a, a Christian religious revival throughout New England. Um, okay, and then we get in 1820, Washington Irvin, Irving um, is kind of talking about an identity paradox. And so that's this concept of all of these things are changing, you know, again, you think 1820, post-revolutionary war, like 50 years after, um, a lot of more of what we would consider like modern ideals are coming forth. And so how do we deal with the socio-political identity of uh, radical change that's super exciting, but also um, like maybe we still want to hang on to the tradition and the seamlessness of connection that tradition brings us. And so there's this equally appealing for people. Um, something is equally appealing between a ton of change and no change at all. And there's this strange paradox that we're going to read in some of the texts uh, written by Washington or Irving. Um, all right, and so then we move into the section titled Exploring Origins. And so I think it's really important to point out, um, and I'm going to point out a couple of things here. Just first of all, that um, while most of our earliest American texts are discovery narratives, uh, the idea that nothing existed before America was discovered is obviously not true. Um, and so thus we have to really kind of question and interrogate the the word discovery or discovered. Um, I, I'm, you might say discovery, I think, is used incorrectly and thus can be hurtful at times if um, it's, 
used to say that this didn't exist before I found it, right? Um, I might say at age 25, I discovered blue cheese, but like I didn't discover blue cheese. I just started eating it. A bunch of other people were already eating blue cheese, right? Um, and so I think that's the concept that maybe I, I misused that word in, in my blue cheese example. And so I think that that's really important. You know, why don't we have uh, texts prior to or why don't we have very many texts prior to the discovery narratives of like uh, Columbus, for example? Um, well, a lot of written tradition was brought over um, when Europeans started exploring what we what we now call America. Um, and a lot of like Native American tradition was oral. So we didn't have anything except for like written accounts after the fact, once writing, print-based writing, was um, brought here. And that's not to say that there weren't forms of remembering stories, but it's they look different. We're going to look at that in a second, but they look different than, you know, what you see on your screen, text-based. Okay, um, so on page six, our textbook says, the question of identity is often tied to the nature of origins. And I wanted to kind of think about that statement for a little bit. I think really what it's saying is that identity is kind of tied to asking where am I from originally? So where are my origins? Because here we're talking about a situation where we are bringing a lot of people together and, and not from the same spaces, right? We are um, bringing Europeans together, we're bringing Africans together, we're, we're in the space of the Native American and indigenous people um, who already lived there. And so how do that those origins, the cultural origins, um, like how do they transform identity when they're brought away from the place where they were to begin with? I don't know if that makes any sense, but you know, we're thinking about like all of these cultures coming together and, and what does that mean for identity, not only with the individual, but also with the collective. And our textbook is trying to explore that as well. Um, and then of course, you know, whatever your origin is, uh, when introduced with new things, things that you didn't previously see, hear, read about, whatever, uh, there's going to be influences. And so we're going to see that happening a lot. Um, people who were did not have any kind of like Christian religion might start using words that are are very religious based in Christianity. And so we're even though, you know, they might be talking about um, their own culture and what was originally their culture, they're using it through the influences of like Christian language. Um, and I think we see some of that in the, one of the first texts that we'll read uh, in the class. Okay, and so then we jump to literary backgrounds and consequences of 1492, which I, my face might be covering. I don't know if you can see that. Um, okay, so here in the book, the, here's something that maybe I should have included in the disclaimer, but, um, you know, we're talking about a really, really, really big time frame here in 26 pages. So, um, our book is attempting to, to mostly focus on the big, important historical um, events, but also, even more importantly, how those events affected literature and writing, because there's no way that our textbook can cover everything that happened. Um, you know, there's like m entire majors <laughs> on just probably this period of time, so which means multiple textbooks and dissertations and things like that. Um, so when Columbus sailed in 1492, there were not many texts published that are considered classics today. Okay, so what's in the canon today, there were few of when Columbus came, uh, you know, where he thought he was going, but found where we are now. Um, he was inspired by the writings of Marco Polo and Sir John Mandeville. So we're talking about exploration narratives. Marco Polo writes about his experiences traveling to China. Um, Sir John Mandeville, I have not read. I do not know what exploration. I think it's the Middle East, but I could be wrong on that. I think our book tells us and I've just forgotten. And so here Columbus is like reading about these guys doing really cool stuff. And I'm um, probably, you know, elaborating a bit much here, but he's reading about this, he wants to do it, and he thinks it's really cool. Um, there, so really, maybe these texts are included in the canon, but they're not really our, our big classics, and we don't really have much of that from his time period. 
that we consider classics. That's not to say that he did not consider certain things classics. Um, and regarding kind of like literature and influences at the time, the printing plus the printing press plays a large role in kind of understanding exploration and expansion, both positively and negatively. And I don't necessarily mean that the writing was, when I say like mostly negative, I don't necessarily mean that the writing was mostly negative. In fact, um, the, the writing was positive, but it negatively affected, and this is certainly subjective, but it negatively affected exploration and expansion. And I guess what I mean is that if all of this writing is is written, but then we get the opportunity not only to share it with one or two people, but to print it and share it in a mass way. And now so many people are learning about exploration um, and reading like uh, John Smith or Christopher Columbus's positive accounts, mostly positive accounts, where at the very least positive for the perspective of Europeans accounts of exploration, then all of the people who get to read all of this because of the printing press, uh, they might be really excited and think that, oh, this is so great, awesome, wonderful, we're doing really good things out in the world. Um, but that's, I consider that mostly negative because, um, you know, we of course had huge negative ramifications of Columbus sailing in 1492. Um, now, that's not to say that there weren't some positive aspects of the printing press affecting exploration and expansion. And so um, the, in the same sense that the writing can share all of the wonderful things about or from the perspective of Columbus and Smith, for example, the wonderful things about exploration, we can also share the terrible things that are happening because of enslavement and um, exploration and the deaths due to, to diseases brought over from Europe. Um, and so for me, I consider that positive. Like I don't, I wouldn't want to just read about how great everything is. I want to know the reality of it. And so um, I would say that the printing press positively gave people the opportunity to see the bad stuff. Um, that might be a little confusing. Um, Okay, so moving on uh, regarding kind of like literature and influences at this time, much of Native American literary culture, like I said before, was oral. Um, there were a couple of like visual ways to remember. However, Native American oral tradition, the part of the point of that was to say you should rely on your memory in your brain, not things that are written down. And honestly, I think with that, we still have that debate uh, today because, you know, we think about like, well, if I can look it up, why do I need to remember it? Um, and so in those visual records from Native American literary culture, we're going to, to look at the Andean Quipu, I don't know if I'm saying that right, and the Wampum Belt um, on the next two slides. Before I get there really quickly though, as a whole, early American lit from this period, the beginnings until 1820, is really a big range across cultures and languages. And we're talking about um, Native American writing, indigenous peoples writing, the explorers, um, the settlers, the colonists. Um, we are talking about uh, writings from people who were enslaved. So it's a huge expanse. And, and again, it ties back to this question of identity. like what is the identity of, of American writing at this time? Uh, and it's so vast, it, it really is. Okay, so an example of the Indian Quipu, I, I can't imagine I'm saying that right. Um, it, it was a it was knotted string used to, I think it's just like a way to remind uh, the speaker of what they needed to say. Um, I do not have, I, I would like to give a suggestion of what I, how I think this was used, but I'm actually not going to do that because I don't know. I've never seen this being used. I've only seen a picture um, of, very, there are a number of, of images of um, this kind of visual reminder during an oral, like when you're telling a story. Um, and I can only imagine how it's been used, but I've never seen it used. So if you want to know, look it up. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the wampum belt, same concept. I don't know how this was used, so I'm just going to show you a picture. But I did find a website that um, kind of shares 
uh, kind of history and examples of these. Um, and these are made of shell beads and they're fashioned together. And I see, I can, again, I can imagine how it's, it's used, but I'm not sure. So I, so I don't want to, um, share any wrong information. All right. Um, so now we're kind of moving, I think, when we get to literary New England, at least in my brain, as I was reading this, something shifted. And I think it shifted from exploration uh, and learning how to kind of navigate um, European culture with native culture and how to figure all of that out. That sounds very positive. I don't think that it was always that positive, but I'm shifting, I think, in my head from that to more of, okay, hey, great, we found this place, or we landed here, we've never seen it before, it's new to us, um, to more of the mindset of, we're going to have it. <laughs> uh, we're gonna send people, they're gonna live here. Um, you know, Jamestown was the first European colony Jamestown, Virginia was the first European colony. Um, but then we get some of the more popular ones. I mean, Jamestown's pretty popular, but then we get some of the ones that, that we're probably even more familiar with, which is um, the settlers of Plymouth and uh, the Massachusetts Bay Colony, um, Pilgrims, Puritans, right? So, it, but it wasn't just the Pilgrims and the Puritans who came over on the Mayflower in the 17th century. Um, there are also plenty of secular settlers, and so, I think we should talk about the difference. Like, I did not know the difference, really. Oh, maybe a little bit. Um, before I read this book, because some of you might know this, but history is my least favorite subject and I didn't pay attention in college or high school or middle school or any of that. Um, pilgrims wanted to separate from the Church of England. So they believed that true churches were voluntary democratic communities. They didn't think that they needed to be told what to do, essentially. Um, Puritans left England as non-separating Congregationalists, so they're still part of the Church of England. They just wanted the Church of England to be more reformed. And from our textbook, and I don't get very much, I mean, there's mo there's so much more. Take a, take a world religions class um, if you're really interested in this, but um, what I get from the book is that the, the belief from the Puritans that it wasn't enough to just be baptized and then you were like a, a person of, of God. Um, you needed to practice and always act devout in your beliefs. Okay, now I, this is what I think I understand from the text. Um, so if that's the case, I'm guessing they're seeing a lot of corruptness in the Church of England and the Reformation isn't necessarily that they wanna do whatever they want. The Reformation is that they need strict, they they want people to be even more devout than what they're seeing in Europe. And so that's why they're still part of the Church of England. They just, they need to do it their own way in a, in a more, I, I would say, strict sense. And then of course we have secular, which is not religious. Um, and I think that there's a difference between secular and atheist and agnostic. And I think that, um, you know, agnostic is the easiest to understand the difference of. It kind of is that you don't know what you believe. You're not necessarily not believing, but you're just not sure. And I think another step further toward atheism, but not totally atheism is secular, meaning like it, it doesn't really matter what, um, whether there is, you know, heaven or a God or, or whatever um, religious being you're believing in a secular person would say, I'm focused in my time here on the earth. And that this might not necessarily be the definition of today. I'm not sure. Um, but I, it, it seems to be the definition the book is talking about. So here we are, we live in the, on the earth. We're focusing on our time here. Anything outside of my lifespan is irrelevant. Um, and then of course we have the furthest, like possibly the furthest, I'm guessing the furthest, the furthest on the opposite of religion, which would be an a atheistic belief in that you, you believe that there is nothing. It's not that it doesn't matter. It's not that you're not sure. It is that there's nothing. There are just people. Um, there's no, no religious being. Okay. Um, so literary New England, uh, writers of early New England were religious. They were pilgrim Puritan writing. We're gonna, I think we'll see others. Um, 
texts also recounted settler, yes, others, settler and native interactions, um, and literature reflected religious tension. You can read about that on page 16 to 17. And then, again, it's vast. It's so much to think about. All right, so then we get the Enlightenment coming in, and we have these Enlightenment ideals, and here they are. So uh, there was this embracement. Can I say that? I'm not sure if that's a word. They embraced the power of the human mind to understand the universe. And um, I think that what from what I'm reading in the book, there was opportunity for the Enlightenment thinkers to say that, like, God doesn't exist. Um, and, and I say God because, you know, really the people we're talking about are Christian thinkers um, or thinking about Christianity, right? So there was the opportunity to say that God doesn't exist. However, they didn't necessarily take that approach. I think they took approach that was going to be more accepted um, and essentially saying, like, well, we are learning more about our world. For example, Newton's laws of motion and gravity, uh, Locke's theory of a blank state. Um, and I think what they're saying is it's not that we don't think God exists. It's that our world is proof of God's existence through the way that it was designed, not necessarily just the teachings of the, like, scripture. So, um, I don't know if that's hard for you to process, and if it is, let me know, because we can talk more about it, but I think that's the concept here, is that it's not that they're complete, these, these scientific ideas or these philosophical ideas are completely denouncing religion. More so, they're saying, actually, this is great proof for your beliefs in religion, but maybe the issue is that the proof is not in the book. The proof is in everything that's around you. Um, another Enlightenment ideal is this concept of sympathy and compassion toward the people in your community as being seen as one's supreme moral obligation. You have a you have to be kind and sympathetic and understanding toward those people around you, whether you agree with them or not, kind of thing. Okay. Um, and Enlightenment ideals also influenced the Great Awakening, which is a religious revival between 1734 and 1750. Simultaneously, there is a, um, a, a Native American spirituality revival. Um, okay, so the final, I'm pretty sure this is the final, yes, the final part of our um, introduction chapter here it talks about pursuing happiness. Um, and really we're getting into uh, that familiar narrative of the Revolutionary War. So in an effort to pay for war debt, Britain taxes the colonies, right? No taxation without representation. Um, and this leads to the Revolutionary Wars where the first battles were Lexington and Concord in April 1775. We get the Declaration of Independence um, and what the book notes, which I found interesting, is that, you know, if you think about the the document with which the United States of America was founded, the Declaration of Independence, and the reason that a lot of people came and colonized, not necessarily discovery and exploration, or exploration and, uh, discovery is not the word I'm looking for, anyway, but colonization. Colonization was very religious-based. The Declaration of Independence, however, is much the pursuit of happiness. Do whatever you want if it's going to make you happy. Um, and religion didn't necessarily play a part in that. Although it did, and it wasn't everyone, right? Um, we know this, and we will read about it. Um, logo Logocracy, I think is how you say this. I thought this was interesting. I've never heard of this before. Again, didn't pay attention in school. A uh, political state or society based on, based in and governed by words. And I thought a lot about this, and I hope that you will too. Um, but just the idea that the texts that are written about and by members of a society really, really, really do have so much weight in shaping the government of that society and in shaping the rules that that society is based off of, um, text-based society, right? I think that's the concept here. Um, I'm sure it's more complicated than that, but I think that's very interesting. Um, and I think that that is part of the reason why around the Revolutionary War, so much writing was political. Um, so much writing is still political. I think that there are absolutely 
scholars out there that would argue that all writing is political. Um, and I found that really interesting. I don't know. Pursuing happiness, what it means to be American was mostly male-dominated. Um, women writers did attempt to have a say. They didn't get the vote until 1920. 1920. <laughs> 100 years ago. Um, American victory in the Revolutionary War was a victory for white men. I think that we all know this, right? Only white men who owned property could vote immediately following American independence. Um, political leaders still enslaved African Americans. Um, and you guys will hear me use the word enslaved instead of held slaves. I do believe that um, like no one has the identity of a slave. They are just enacted upon, they are enslaved. Uh, and so I'm trying to use language that reflects that. Um, so your political leaders, Washington, Jefferson, Franklin, notably. Um, Native American displacement, right? We're talking about pushing um, Native people west, forcing them onto reservations. Uh, so again, yes, pursuit of happiness, but not for everybody. Um, I, and then there's, I also found a voting rights timeline and I, y'all, I didn't really check on um, like the site that published it, but it looked all right. Um, that voting rights timeline, if you choose to click on it, it kind of explains a lot of information about um, just, just how citizenship is, um, f like not how it's given, but when, when different people were able to get citizenship and also debates on citizenship and thus voting rights. So I thought that was really interesting and I, I kind of perused it a little bit. Um, perused isn't the right word, but. Um, okay, so that's the end of my slides on this chapter, which would bring you, you know, if you're reading along, this would bring you to the end of the chapter. So I hope that you found this helpful in at least explaining some of the main points in the text. Again, um, the text is the quiz uh, the quiz is on the text, not on me, but I am helping to kind of facilitate that text with this lecture. So if you guys have any questions, please send me an email, let me know. Um, otherwise, good luck on the unit quiz. Remember, it's open the entire unit. You don't just have to take it in week one. It's open the whole, for all of unit one, and then it closes and it never gets open again. Um, okay, yes, email me if you have questions.